Hey, hey, chemistry, how you doing? It's time for another flipped lecture. We just answered the question, will this reaction happen? And now we're going to ask the question, how fast will this reaction happen? So spontaneous reactions are spontaneous. They will occur. But maybe they don't occur quickly. Um, generally speaking, it is true that the, the greater the magnitude of a negative delta G, the faster it will happen. That is generally true. But we need to uh, be a little bit more specific about that because there are some very spontaneous reactions that in fact take a while. So kinetics is the part of chemistry that looks at how fast do chemical reactions happen. So we've already asked uh, and answered, will it happen? Now we're gonna ask and answer, how quickly will it happen? Let's jump right in, here we go. So thermodynamics answers the question, will it react? Kinetics answers the question, how fast will it react? If you get a negative delta G, it can happen. But will it fizzle or bang? In other words, is this going to be a long, slow process? Or is this going to be a process that goes very, very quickly? Kinetics is the answer to that. Okay, So kinetic studies are represented by energy diagrams. Um, they talk about the, uh, the energy of the reactants and the energy of the products and then the activation energy. Now this is what plays a big role in how fast it happens. The difference between the reactant energy and the product energy, this is the delta H. And you could have a delta H that's the same with a very small bump or a very large bump. The bump is called an activation energy or an energy of activation. And what that means is how much work, how much energy do you have to put into the chemical reaction for it to get started? Now, delta H calculations will tell you if it's going to wind up being exothermic or endothermic and the, the elevation change here between reactants and products. But delta H doesn't tell you this. Sometimes it's a very favorable delta H change, but it's a very tall transition state or activation energy. And so it's really hard to get the reaction to get enough energy to actually happen. Think of it as a roller coaster. If you start here and then you get towed up the track, the machinery of the roller coaster ride is doing the work to get you to the top of the hill. Once you're at the top of the hill, the car will roll down to the finish and you get to say, Wee, right? But you've got to get to the top of the hill first. There's work to be put in before the reaction can happen. Here's another couple of examples. This would be an example of an endothermic reaction. Delta H is positive, and um, the reactants have less energy than the products. And you've got to put all of this activation energy in before the reaction happens. And then the reaction will happen, because this is more energetic than this. So the reaction will coast down to the products, and this reaction will happen. But after you've dumped in a truckload of energy to get it to happen, OK? Um, versus an exothermic reaction where you have to add a little bit of energy, but then you get back more than you put in, which means all of this energy shedding out is available to start the next chemical reaction. Things like this can become chain reactions. Things like this, not so much. Okay. Um, just another example of an exothermic reaction. This one is drawn with actually no, reactive, no activation energy. It's incredibly rare for a reactants to be put together and the reaction just, boom, falls to the products. This is, uh, this is rare, but there are examples of this, okay? Um, there's also very few examples of this where it's an endothermic reaction. You add all the energy to get the reaction to happen and then you're done and there's no downward hill slide. So again, not very common to not see a bump. Almost all the time you see a bump of some kind, okay? So moving on. Why do, do uh, reactions need to have energy added to them? Well, one theory, one model for chemical reactions is called the collision theory, where there's a, uh, two reactants and they have to run into each other, but running into each other is not enough. They have to run into each other in the right orientation so that the parts of the molecule that have to interact with each other do. And they have to run into each other with enough force for the kinetic energy to be there to make the reaction happen. So they've got to collide in the right orientation and they have to collide with enough energy. If they don't collide with enough energy or they don't collide in the right orientation, no chemical reaction happens. And so the energy you have to add 
is the is the uh, orienting of these molecules the right way and the kinetic energy to run them into each other with enough force. When that right kind of collision happens in this situation, at the moment of reaction, it's called an activated complex. So you have molecule A, you have molecule B, and molecule A and B hit each other at the right orientation and the right amount of kinetic energy so that the chemical reaction happens. And something occurs where they like bond together for a minute and then reactions happen, whatever they have happen, and then they move apart from each other. That moment when they're joined and their chemistry is occurring, that split second is called the activated complex. Okay? The activated complex is the moment when the chemistry is occurring. And that is the highest energy point of the reaction. Generally speaking, the products will roll downhill from there. They have less energy in the products than the activated complex. You've got to add the energy up to the activated complex. And once you're there, chemistry happens. Okay? So here's just a quick little picture of that. Uh, you have another mole one molecule running into the back of another molecule. And they have to bump into each other in the right way for this red white molecule to kick off the green part of the molecule. I don't know what all these things are. It doesn't really matter. They have to run into each other in the right orientation and with the right velocity for that to happen. And that split second when the red is in contact before the green has left, that's the activation complex. These things don't last very long because that's inherently unstable. Very high energy, lots of complexity. It's going to fall apart quickly, right? And the chemistry occurs. But that moment, that's the activation complex. The energy needed to get that thing to exist is the activation energy. And that activation energy is used to break old bonds or make new bonds or change the chemistry in some way, right? That's the activation energy. So that's the peak of those, of those activation profiles. Reaction rates are, are mathematical expressions that tell us how fast a reaction is happening. And the unit of measurement is usually moles per second how many moles of compound are being made every second, right? Moles per second. Um, and it can be affected by lots of things. It can be affected by concentration. It can be affected by temperature. It can be affected by surface area and by catalysts. So we'll get to catalysts in a second. Concentration affects it because the more of these things that are running into each other in a small space, the, um, the more likely the right kind of collision will happen. Okay. Temperature affects it because the faster they're running into each other, the hotter it is with more kinetic energy because of thermal energy, the more likely they are to run into each other with the right velocity, the right force. Um, uh, surface area um, impacts it because if you have a big glob of a molecule, only the stuff on the outside can react and the things inside can't. So smaller particle sides means that you have more molecules that can react. So reactions will always happen faster with particles than big blocks of something, okay? And then uh, catalysts. Catalysts act by prearranging collisions so that they happen in the right orientation. And so the, the part of the, the slowdown for chemical reactions is that they're not in the right orientation. Catalysts fix that. They reorient things before they collide, right? Um, catalysts are substances that increase reaction rates by lowering the activation energy and are not consumed in chemical reactions. So you get the catalyst back when you're done. Um, and so biology, we talked all about those. We call them enzymes, and you're familiar with the concept. Here we have uh, just an example of a catalyzed versus a not catalyzed reaction. In the uncatalyzed version, you have a high activation energy. You've got to put a lot of energy into it to get to your products. Same delta H, don't worry about this, same delta H reactant versus product, but it's high without a catalyst and low with a catalyst. You still have to add some energy, but not as much because the catalyst rearranges things so that they collide in the right orientation, okay? Sometimes catalysts take one big step and break it into s several smaller steps. So this is an example of a catalyzed uh, reaction where without the catalyst, very high activation energy all in one step goes down to the products. Here we have uh, a series of uh, three, four, five reactions, all of which have smaller activation energies that still gets you from the reactants to the products. Same change in, in energy, same delta G, same delta H, same delta S, but um, we've instead of having a big activation energy, we've had 
a relatively small activation energy. Okay. So catalysts work by prearranging reactants into the right orientation so that it's easier to form an activation complex. If this molecule has to hook up with this molecule so they can go like that, right? In the wild world, they might bump into each other this way. That doesn't help you. But a catalyst might take them and stick them in the right orientation and then allow them to collide so the reacting can happen. Enzymes are a particular kind of catalyst. They're in biological systems and they're made out of proteins. And you learned truckloads of enzymes in biology, so this is review for you, right? An inhibitor you also learned about in biology a little bit, but we're going to hit it a little bit harder here in chemistry. An inhibitor is something that gets in the way of a catalyst. So a catalyst is there doing its job, making reactions, and then an inhibitor comes in and it can't do what it's supposed to do. It stops the functioning of a catalyst. These occur in biological systems. Um, you have catalysts in your stomach that break down food, and if we didn't stop those things from doing their job when there was no food in your stomach, you would digest your stomach. So God designed you to have inhibitors for stomach acid that are in there when you're not actually digesting food so that you don't digest yourself. Praise Jesus for inhibitors. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. Some pathogens have inhibitors that stop your body from being able to fight them. Okay, So inhibitors stop catalysts. Here's an example. Again, not my video. I don't have credit for this, but it worked. So Catalysts here. are substances that speed chemical reactions without being used up in those reactions. In cells, catalysts are usually large globular proteins ah. known as enzymes. There is a portion of an enzyme, its active site, that binds only to a particular molecule, its substrate. The substrate is a participant in the reaction catalyzed by the enzyme. The binding of substrate to enzyme causes a change in the shape of the enzyme, which in turn facilitates the forming or breaking of bonds by the substrate. The product of the reaction is released, and the enzyme is available once again. Because of the fit between substrate and active site, each enzyme is specific for a particular reaction. So the, uh, the reaction here, it just, um, it, the, the catalyst will only fit one thing. Catalysts will do one thing. Catalysts don't catalyze any old reaction. They're made specifically, especially enzymes like this, are made specifically for one reaction. So God designed a particular catalyst to do a particular job. That's why you have millions of catalysts in your body, because there are millions of chemical reactions that need to happen, right? Um, and that is it. If you have any questions, um, you can put them in the comments field below, and I will get to them as quickly as I can, or I can see you in class tomorrow, and we'll work through it together. Jesus loves you, and so do I. Have a wonderful evening. Good night.